What I want to do is tell uh, an improbable story, how a small liberal arts college on the coast of Maine came to own an island in Canada that's about two miles long, 200 acres, sitting out in the cold Bay of Fundy. It was first occupied by Europeans uh, in 1799. John Kent came over from England and farmed it with his family, had eight children. He died in 1828, and his widow, Susanna, lived alone on the island until 1853. It was largely abandoned until uh, the beginning of, of the, um, at the turn of the century, and then, as you will see, uh, ultimately came into the hands of Bowdoin and became a biological research station. It's a member of the Organization of Biological Field Stations, an international group of 200-odd field stations, and I think it may be unique among all universities and colleges. Uh, Chuck Huntington may be able to correct me if I'm wrong here. Possibly Oxford University has a field station that's a, a permanent field station that's a, uh, on an island and that's a seabird breeding island. So Bowdoin has something that's really special, and I'm going to tell the story of how it came to be. Right, let's see, is this going to be, that's the one I think I want, good. Um, it takes about 11 hours on a good day to get to Kent Island from Brunswick. It involves a drive, a four-hour drive across Maine, crossing at Callis and St. Stephen, and then you enter the province of New Brunswick, another hour drive, and you're in the fishing village of Black's Harbor on the coast. You take a two-hour or an hour-and-a-half ferry out to the large, um, kind of uh, triangular-shaped island alone in the Bay of Fundy and drive to the southern tip of that, the fishing village of Seal Cove, shown here on the right. Catch a lobster boat, go out to sea uh, for another hour, moor in Kent Island's harbor, sh shift your stuff to a skiff, get on shore, walk uh, 45 minutes, and you can see why it's, it's 11 hours on a good day. One of the things that makes it special is its location. It's the outermost island in the Grand Manan Archipelago, the last vegetated island. If you head south from Kent Island, the next piece of land that you might hit, if you hit it, would be Bermuda. The other thing that makes it unique is the fact that it's a, an enormously rich fishing ground, and it is that because of upwelling that occurs due to the Labrador current that swings around the peninsula of Nova Scotia and goes in through that dark blue channel and hits landforms that push that cold water up. That's also not only why it's so nutrient rich and why you get these seabird breeding islands and a lot of marine mammals like right whales, but uh, that's also what makes it so cold and foggy. Grand Manan is a really special place to be associated with. Um, I'm sorry that uh, Russell Ingalls, our caretaker, who's a Grand Manan fisherman, wasn't able to make it. He was planning to, but um, this, they couldn't fight the snowstorm down. But if you look at the five villages on the coast of Grand Manan on the way down to Seal Cove to make it out to Kent Island, they look very different from most villages you'd see in Maine. They're real uh, herring and lobster and sea urchin um, and scallop working uh, communities. Um, there are about 3,000 people who live on Grand Manan year-round. You see very few um, tourists a little bit in the summer, but it's kind of a, it's a hard, cold uh, place, but with a rich history, and we're so lucky to be part of it. The story I'm going to tell is probably one of the few stories that could be told that involves the Luvumba Valley in the Belgian Congo, uh, Tristan de Cunha Islands in the South Atlantic, Barro Colorado Island in Panama, and the Bay of Fundy. Um, everything I tell you tonight, to the best of my knowledge, is true. It will not sound true, <laughs> but I want to say that in advance, with two exceptions. I am going to tell two stretchers, but you'll, I think you'll be able to recognize uh, what the stretchers are. So it involves three really odd places. Panama, where the idea for the field station was spawned. Tristan de Cunha, where a bird made a wrong turn. Uh, Luvumba Valley in the Belgian Congo, uh, where a, a quest for a very rare bird took place. And ultimately, it ended up in the Kent Island, which is the biggest island here, becoming the site of the Bowdoin Scientific Station. And then, thanks to a, a lead gift by Bill Gross and uh, many other supporters of Kent Island, including David Webster, 
Hay Island and Sheep Island were added in 2003, and now the Bowdoin College owns the entire archipelago. It involves uh, also three birds. The top bird on the left is a bird called the yellow-nosed albatross. It's a bird with a wingspan, I don't know, Jan? Seven feet, seven or eight feet. Common eider, um, lower left. And a bird that I just have a black and white illustration of here because it might or might not have existed uh, called Grower's Broadbill. So those three birds are, play a key role in how Ken Island came to Bowdoin College. And it involves three amazing men. On the left, uh, Ernest Joy, a grand man and fisherman. Next to him, holding a Cory Bustard. Uh, Alan Moses, a grand man and fisherman as well, an amateur taxidermist. And Bill Gross, um, taken in this picture, I think he was 18 or 19 years old, just finished his first year at Bowdoin. Uh, and he had a, had a vision. Now, um, Bowdoin has a long history of ornithology, dating way back to its, its uh, benefactor, James Bowdoin III. Um, and so it's only fitting that we be a, 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 a lead campus across the whole nation in the study of ornithology. You'll note him holding uh, gingerly a blackbird or something, and in his belt he's got a couple of more. And although he was born to, exactly two centuries before I was, I realized that in many ways my childhood was quite similar to, um, to his, <laughs> his childhood. Uh, so uh, Alan has given you a, a little bit of background, and I, I want to show you some pictures. Um, I was the, uh, the fifth of five boys, uh, and I'm afraid to say a, a bit of a disappointment to my parents. Um, they were... Uh, they were eager to have a daughter, and they weren't going to stop until they did. And on the sixth try, they did get a daughter. Um, I was also kind of a, a bookish lad right from the get-go, as you can see. Um, a little more serious than my older brothers, who were uh, throwing knives and, and firing off weapons all the time. And I, I preferred to, to study. Um, <laughs> and here's my grandfather, who... Uh, in fact, uh, it's, this is all true, um, although my brother George may have a slightly different memory of it. Uh, but he had a kind of a puberty ritual, which was that when we reached the age of each of his five grandsons reached the age of 11 or 12 or whatever he imagined puberty to be, they would be invited, summoned really, down to his rural house and he would present them with a, a shotgun and, and a lecture on gun safety and a lecture on, on uh, manliness. <coughs> So uh, this is my brother Peter here, uh, next oldest to me, and, and uh, he's uh, been instructed to, on how to shoot birds. But when my turn came, um, and instead of a shotgun, I, I got binoculars. Um, now, as Alan said, uh, I had to wait a while. I actually did get my gun, and I got it in kind of a funny way, and this is a good lesson maybe for Bowdoin students. Spring of my senior year, I was taking ornithology from Charles Sibley, who many of you may know as a leader in molecular biology, one of the first people to apply <clears throat> a technique called protein electrophoresis and then after that DNA hybridization to try to unravel the evolutionary history of all the birds of the world. And I walked into his office and said that I was interested in traveling after I graduated from college. Uh, did he have suggestions? And he said... Uh, how would you like to go to Colombia and Ecuador and collect bird blood samples for me? And I said, boy, that'd be fabulous. I'd, I'd love to do that for the year. But I would need someone to go along with me who was fluent in Spanish and knew how to handle a gun. Um, so uh, <laughs> so he, he hired a classmate of mine uh, named Jeannie Stevens. Um, and uh, just as, as luck would have it, she ended up also at Bowdoin. She's now teaching in... Uh, in uh, Romance languages. But we spent the year there, um, so I, I did get my gun. So back to my story. Um, the first hero of Ken Island is a f this fisherman, Ernest Joy. He was born in 1877 on an island just south of Grand Manan called Wood Island. It's actually between Ken Island, sorry, yeah, between Ken Island and Grand Manan. And like many Grand Mananers, he was an astute naturalist. So one day when he was out fishing just west of Ken Island, on the way out towards Machias Seal Island, he noticed a bird he'd never seen before and um, did what most ornithologists of the era, any self-respecting ornithologist would do, and that is to shoot the bird. Um, 
So he shot it, and this is the original specimen that he took. It's currently in the American Museum of Natural History. So picture this bird, seven or eight foot wide uh, wingspan. There's the original tag. It's, it was misidentified as Lazen albatross. Collected southeast breaker off Machias Seal Island, August 1st, 1913. Shot by Ernest A. Joy in the collection of Alan Moses. It turned out to be the first record in all of North America of this species, yellow-nosed albatross, which is known to nest on Tristan de Cunha Islands in the South Pacific and a few other islands as well. So it was a real, uh, it was a real splash in the world of ornithology. Alan Moses was the second Grammanian fisherman that I mentioned, and he was the one who actually prepared the specimen and, and put it in his museum on Grammanand. Now, before you um, jump to any conclusions about Ernest's uh, ethical behavior shooting this bird, you need to understand a little bit about how ornithology was practiced at the turn of the century before people had good binoculars. And, um, they would ha probably have had access to this book. This is one of the most important studies at the time, bird studies. It was a field, the early field guide, an account of the land birds of eastern North America. And I expect Alan Moses and Ernest Joy had a copy of it. And <clears throat> it was useful because if you looked out your window and you saw a small bird hovering by, uh, by the flowers in your garden, uh, you could simply get your shotgun out and shoot it and then pick it up and take a look at it and <laughs> compare it to the plate in the book. And yes, sure enough, it, it is a ruby-throated hummingbird, uh, adult female. And you could, you could spend a, a lovely day um, uh, going through the woods and uh, identifying birds as you did. <clears throat> so this was really um, part of the part of the uh, ethos of the day. So he gave this specimen to Alan Moses, who was four years younger than Ernest Joy. He was born in 1881 in Grand Manan, and the son of, uh, of a good naturalist as well. Alan prepared the specimen, and word quickly got out to the American Museum of Natural History in New York about the existence of this absolute novelty, and of course they wanted it in their museum. So they sent a delegation up from New York City to uh, remote Grand Manan, bringing kind of mirrors and baubles and things like that in hopes of exchanging it for this specimen. But Alan Moses was a little smarter than that, and he said, no, I'll give it to you for free on the condition that you allow me to accompany an American Museum of Natural History expedition to some exotic spot. So that was in 1913. He had to wait 15 years until 1928. But in 1928, Alan Moses got his wish. And he was taken on as the taxidermist on an expedition to what was then Tanganyika and the Belgian Congo, now the Democratic Republic of Congo and Tanzania, um, on an expedition that was financed by an amateur ornithologist uh, named J. Sterling Rockefeller. They're pictured on the left. So picture this, if you can. Uh, Alan Moses, a fisherman from a small fishing village in the Bay of Fundy, is in Tanzania with some Maasai porters, two rhino horns, and one of the richest men in the world at his side. And he has a look, a slightly befuddled look on his face to me, like, <laughs> how, now how did I get here? Um, reading his letters home is just fascinating because he was half Rockefeller's age and came from such a different world, but they got on famously. Uh, Rockefeller had great respect for him. They, tr they were great traveling companions. Rockefeller would occasionally leave Moses and go off and have a game of golf with uh, one of the consuls in the area. The main purpose of this expedition, though, was a very rare bird, or, or a bird that might not even exist anymore, called, called Grower's Broadbill, a bird maybe about this size, like a robin or, or, or something like that. <clears throat> there was only one specimen in the world. It was in the Rothschild Collection in, in England. And Rockefeller funded an expedition to the tune of $150,000 to get that specimen, in addition to others. They tromped for 14 months, beginning in 1928, they found themselves uh, frustrated yet again in eastern Belgian Congo. And along the way, poor Alan Moses uh, contracted malaria. So he was left behind in camp while Rockefeller and some of the other members of the troop went off yet again for a fruitless day hunting Grower's Broadbill. And lying in this malarial fever stupor in his hammock, alone in the camp, Moses happened to look up in the tree and there 
was Grower's Broadbill. So you know what he did. Um, so this is, the, uh, <laughs> this is the original specimen that Alan Moses shot of Grower's Broadbill. <clears throat> now, Rockef this, of course, made Rockefeller's investment and, and, uh, and made the expedition a success. And so over a campfire, according to um, Alan Moses' notes, that evening, Rockefeller turned to Moses and said, my good fellow, what can I do to repay you for your incredible achievements? And Alan Moses said, there's a little island back where I come from, <clears throat> off of the island of Grand Manan, called Kent Island. And it's, a, it's the last refuge of a bird called the common eider. Now, common eiders, if you were to go out tomorrow morning out to Popham Beach or Morse Mountain or something like that, you would see them by the hundreds or thousands in big rafts. In the early, in the 1920s, one estimate was that there were 30 pairs remaining in the entire Gulf of Maine, and they all nested on Kent Island. They were, um, they were um, exploited for their eider down and for their eggs, and they had become perilously close to extinction. And Alan Moses and his sister were the, were the two people to promote the idea of, of a field station. <clears throat> so here's an article in McLean's magazine from 1942 about Alan Moses. He saved the fundy eider. That's a uh, male eider on the left and a female eider on the right, and they're, they're big sea ducks that are fairly easy to see. Um, so Rockefeller, being a man of his word, uh, wanted to pay Moses back for the Grower's broad bill. He went ahead and bought for one-sixth the cost of this expedition Kent Island and set up a sanctuary for birds, for the eiders. The eiders quickly rebounded. And he made Alan Moses and another Graham and Anna, Ralph Griffin, uh, the first two wardens of Kent Island back in 1930. <clears throat> now, Rockefeller didn't get rich by starting uh, bird sanctuaries, um, so he always had his eye out for a way to make a little extra cash. So in addition to being a bird sanctuary, he thought, well, maybe it should be a silver fox fur farm as well. So those cages that you see on the left, and for Kent Islanders, that's down near the cow barn and the outhouse, um, and you may, you may have seen some of that wire pressed down in the grass. That's where his uh, silver fox fur farm was from 1930 for several years. Alan Moses here on the right was not too enthusiastic about the idea. He could sort of see the, connect, the contradiction between um, these two ideas. But, um, but uh, Rockefeller was, uh, again, intent on figuring out what to do with this island in the Bay of Fundy now that he owned it. Now, at almost exactly the same time, actually in 1927... Bowdoin ornithology professor Alfred Gross, shown on the left, um, was awarded a sabbatical. And he traveled all over the world uh, doing research on birds. And he brought with him his son, Bill, who I believe is 12 in this picture. And they're in Panama. Notice uh, what Bill's got around his hip here. He's, he, so he, he was in the guns as well. And this picture was taken on Barrow, Colorado Island in Panama, right in the middle of the um, Panama Canal. And Bill, was, Bill tucked this idea, he told me, uh, away in his head of a field station because Barrow, Colorado Island is the field station of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, very famous biological field station. <clears throat> so when Bill ended up going to Bowdoin um, some years, not too many years later, uh, it happened that Ernst Meyer, a famous evolutionary biologist at Harvard, persuaded Bowdoin ornithologist Alfred Gross to send some Bowdoin students up to Kent Island to do uh, some bird surveys. So that's the kind of before picture on the left, the four Bowdoin students who were sent on this expedition. Here they are on the right, and then uh, Bill is, is uh, circled. Now, um, I don't know what got into uh, Jan Pearson's uh, mind um, and Peter Connell back in 1980 when they were up there, but they started a sort of a funny tradition of posing in the same poses as the original <laughs> four Ken Island um, pioneers. Uh, I mean, notice the, the collar of the guy in the back. <laughs> um, they got it. They got it just just right. Um, so it's uh, it's it's continued um, to this day. Uh, although it's sort of <laughs> taken taken different different turns um, in different <laughs> years. But this is the one, I think, in a way that's the most interesting um, mimic of the picture. 
uh, for two reasons. One, if you add up the ages of these four people on the right, it adds up to 284 years. Uh, and collectively, there's more than two centuries of experience on Ken Island. That's the first interesting thing. The second interesting thing is that the person on the left in both pictures is the same person. Um, so that's Bill Gross when he came back to the island in 1999, <clears throat> 65 years later, is that? Um, from uh, after his first visit. So Bill went up there in 1934 with the four pioneers. There was a lot of excitement and hype. Um, he, he was very good at getting um, publicity. So there were articles coming out throughout the 30s and early 40s in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, <clears throat> excited articles, uh, Dr. Grossen's son, William, members of separate expeditions. And the idea was sort of these are, they were, these were at the scale of um, Arctic expeditions of Perry and Macmillan. Of course, it turns out that Ken Island's actually not in the Arctic. It's almost due east of Brunswick. Um, and they weren't the first um, uh, Europeans ever to get there either. They'd been there a couple centuries before them. But nonetheless, <clears throat> it was a, a very exciting time. Um, here's Bill on the, uh, on the left with the uh, pith helmet. I'm not sure whether he got that from uh, Alan Moses or from, from, uh, from um, his time in Panama, but it was kind of the, the flavor of the era. Everybody, they were named captain and expedition leader, and uh, it was a slight military feel to it all. But this is the 1935 crowd, and this is the year when Rockefeller visited his island, saw what was going on with these Bowdoin students exploring the biology of birds, and turned to uh, Bill and said, what do you think about this as uh, a gift to Bowdoin? And it was Bill's vision to, to make it into something like the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute's biological field station. <clears throat> so it actually transferred to Bowdoin in January of 1936, but the field station started in the summer of uh, 1935. Bill was great at getting free stuff. He, he got onto this idea, I think he was inspired by Admiral Byrd, um, of writing companies and saying, hey, we'll sponsor your company if you send us an Ele Electrolux fridge. So here's um, someone on the island, I'm not sure who, cutting a, a slab of seal meat uh, to put into the, fr the fridge. Uh, you don't want to go into the, uh, the, the far north without your shredded wheat and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and in the hazardous Bay of Fundy expedition, uh, you really need a, need a Hamilton watch. Um. Uh, and, of course, your Phillips Delicious Cans. That, that looks like a, a great summer for food, doesn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> now, the first year was called the Bowdoin Biological Station, but there were two aspects of the work being done there that were a little broader than biology. One was uh, radio transmission. So here's Charles Ruxtall from MIT, who did a lot of work on, in radios, um, and also in weather uh, meteorology, as you'll see in, in some of the other pictures with Bob Cunningham. So in 19, I think it was 36, it became the Bowdoin Scientific Station. <clears throat> so this is the sound of leeches' storm petrels. If you close your eyes and if we could darken the room and get rid of the exit signs, you'd have a feeling for what it's like to be on Ken Island at night. The first, uh, oh, good, hey, thank you. <laughs> Just shut your eyes and you really have it. Um, the, the first recordings of Leech's Storm Petrel were done on Kent Island. Uh, this was done in the 30s, and I don't believe anybody did another recording until the 60s. And the way you had to do it back then was to use a, a large parabolic reflector there with wires going back to a shortwave radio, which transmitted the sound from Kent Island to Grand Manan, where there was a great big recording truck. So you, you couldn't have a little digital recorder. There's Alfred Gross, second from the left, supervising all of this. So a lot of the early work in the 30s was work on the biology of seabirds. Uh, one of the things they did was to um, answer a question I'm sure you, you've all been curious about, which is how many leeches storm petrel adults can a great black back gull eat in 20 minutes? And the answer is five. <clears throat> now, about that time, 1937 to be exact, uh, a young man named Bob Cunningham came to the island, and he struck up a friendship with Ernest Joy, who had replaced Alan Moses as caretaker of the island. Actually, uh, Ernest was caretaker from 1934 on, actually till 1949, and he um, 
was helped in odd jobs by a carpenter named Lester Tate. But Bob Cunningham came to study the weather. He continued that study, as you'll see, for 60 years and developed the most extraordinary friendship with uh, this fisherman from Wood Island, Grandma Nan, and they exchanged letters. And Bob has kept all those letters, and I have copies of them, thanks to Peter, um, 41 letters. And they tell a story that would have been lost because during the war years in particular, Ernest was the only one out there. The field station was largely abandoned. So here's one of his letters. Dear, dear Bob, and, and Ernest was known as a real storyteller and could really turn a phrase. Dear Bob, well, another month has gone and no let up in the fog. One clear day and a week of fog. It just clears enough to keep my eyebrows from molding. Everything is wet and gets no time to dry. God will it ever end. Um, and he has a wonderful turn of phrase. I always like this for when you're really busy, is it, is it, with reference to Lester coming down to do some carpentry work. Well, Lester was down and going around like a fart in a mitten. <laughs> whatever, whatever that is. <laughs> um, but going around and around. He had, he had three days' work to do in one. <clears throat> uh, and I guess I'll have to go over to see this. Um, so during the war, as I said, very few people came. I have to get up close to read this. This is a letter from 1942. Dear Bob, well, you notice he always starts with well. Well, another month has gone and the summer is going. I have been looking for a letter, but none as yet have I seen. Are you still teaching? There has been a lot of things drifting around. Some is lumber, lard, coffee, airplane parts, and dead men. <laughs> There has been four bodies found around Graham and Ann. Lee Wilcox picked up one off South Head Graham and Ann, one at Gannett Rock, two at Long Island. I have not found any yet, and glad I am. <laughs> there was some lumber and some bucket of lard. I got the bucket, and the gulls got the lard. <laughs> uh, Ernest was also very proud of this rubber suit that he got. And he, he told a story. I can't believe this is true, but he said a... a but he was famous on Graham and Ann for telling the stories. People would come to Graham and Ann just to Kent Island just to hear him spin the yarns. But he said a house floated up on the beach, but just a wall of a house. And he, and he walked into the house and looked at the wall, and there was a hook on the wall, and on the hook was hanging the rubber <laughs> suit. So that's him posing in his rubber suit. Um, um, fast forward ahead. Uh, 73 years, and I think Ernest would be pleased that uh, in many ways, Ken Island looks much the same. So that's a picture from the 30s. On the left, you can see the uh, silver fur, silver fox uh, fur farm, and um, pretty much the same on the right. Uh, the forest is still a simple, magic, enchanted place. Very low diversity, but very beautiful everywhere you look. Uh, it's not at all like the Smithsonian Tropical Research Station in Panama. There are only nine or ten tree species there and 250 plant species as opposed to thousands and thousands in Panama. But it has its own unique beauty. Because of the cold air, the fog, it's much more like the top of a mountain in Maine than it is uh, something that's at sea level. Um, and spectacular uh, birds, about 200 bird species come through and this dramatic Bay of Fundy Tides. At Ken Island, it's about uh, a 20-foot tidal amplitude. Uh, getting there is still pretty much as difficult as it was when Ernest was there. Our current caretaker, Taker Russell Ingalls, uh, takes us from Seal Cove, uh, the hour across the Bay of Fundy, to the Three Island Harbor, Hay, Sheep, and Kent. And Moore's uh, transfers to a skiff that actually Marco built and gets us to shore. So this is, these are two different field trips. This, last, this one was last uh, March when I went with my advanced winter field ecology course. And from there, you do a lot of walking across the basin if it's frozen. Let's see. Uh, and then in summer, you get to go uh, across the mud at low tide. <coughs> uh, the facilities are still... As simple as they always were, um, uh, no running water. And uh, when the sun comes out, once a week or so, you get to take a bath. Um, one thing is different, um, and Ernest, I'm sure, would notice it right away. Marco, actually, after we got an NSF grant in the early 90s, built a wing off the old uh, 
hay barn on the left, that's a, now known as the, dor- the dorm, and the wing on the right, just attached to it with a breezeway, is, a, is a, uh, a lab where we do our research. The other thing that's different from the old days is that we run entirely on solar energy, solar panels there on the roof. Inside the lab on the left looks, oops, I need to go back one, looks like this. Uh, this is actually, my, again, my, my uh, spring trip last year. People, the students were pretty pooped, I guess. Um, <laughs> and, um, and on the right, uh, it gives you some indication of what we have to dress like in summer. This actually is a, is a September field trip. Uh, but it's cold and, and rainy and foggy a lot of the time, I have to say. Now, over the years, we've had some very distinguished visitors, um, Casey Sills on the left was the first Bowdoin president to come to visit uh, Kent Island, and he's holding a a leech of storm petrel nestling in his hand. And he came out in 1948 when the college had pretty much abandoned the field station during the war years um, and and sort of resurrected it. Um, And and, um, so that was really important. He put Ray Painter in charge as director. He was a graduate student at the time at Yale, and it was Ray, actually, who... um, probably made his most enduring contribution by introducing Kent Island to Chuck and Chuck to Kent Island, uh, bringing him up. Chuck was a fellow Yale graduate student at the time. Second president is shown in this slide on the left. That's um, Spike Coles. And next to him is Alfred Gross, Jim Moulton, a professor in the middle. Rex Harris was the um, caretaker at the time, and everybody will recognize from the sweater, if nothing else, (laughs) uh, who that is on the right. That's taken in 1953. And more recent uh, uh, distinguished uh, presidential visitors, uh, Bob and Blythe Edwards, came. They were the first to come in a sailboat. And, uh, of course, Barry and Karen came in, I believe, 2004. And you'll notice uh, Chuck in the same sweater uh, (laughs) some years after. Um, We've also had other uh, distinguished uh, visitors, just to show a few. And one of the distinguished visitors there on the right, Alan's son David, is now a Bowdoin student. Um, But they're both holding savanna sparrows, kind of like James Bowdoin III, actually, (laughs) the grip you've got on them. So people often wonder what it is we do (laughs) on Kent Island and how you can spend two months in the fog and cold. And that's a a good question. Um, Do you get island fever? Well, first and foremost, it's a place to, to learn how to do science and to do science. So usually we have eight undergraduates, typically six from Bowdoin, two from other institutions, so we get some intellectual cross-pollination. Several graduate students, uh, faculty researchers from various institutions and federal agencies in Canada and the U.S. coming to do research. And the research isn't just about birds, uh, pollination biology here, uh, marine intertidal work, um, Peter Krychek is my honors thesis student working on lichen ecology. Anna Bender did some cool work on uh, the response of the forest to um, uh, removal of an introduced herbivore. I'll talk about it in just a moment. But most of the work probably over the years has been about birds. Uh, we've had long-term studies of tree swallows here nesting in, in a permanent set of uh, nest boxes. The king of all the birds on Ken Island has to be the leech of storm petrel. So this is a little bird that you heard called before. It's about the size of a robin, maybe a little bit smaller. Nocturnal in its comings and goings to the island. The reason for that is that uh, it's, it's a mouthful for a, a gull or a falcon or a raven. They nest in burrows in the ground. And um, Chuck Huntington began a study of these birds back in 1953. I think this is... The, holds the record for the longest term study in the field of any population of plants or animals by a single individual. So that was uh, before, and here's uh, after. And Chuck is still at it at age 88, I'm glad to see, and I'm sure he's planning next summer's research as well. Now, growing out of that work, because of the foundation that Chuck laid, have been some incredible collaborations. Mark Hausman is shown here with a plastic cap of a Lancet, I guess, in his mouth, uh, working with Ben Chan, a Bowdoin student, taking blood samples from leeches storm petrel of known age. And the work that they have done, this collaboration, has been featured in Discover Magazine and listed as one of the top science stories in all the sciences in 2003, also picked up and featured in science. Um, 
And what they're discovering is that leeches storm petrels, which lived at 35 years or older, apparently have some molecular mechanism to either repair uh, the tips of their chromosomes from eroding the cell division. Something allows them to live much, much longer than other birds. And that could not have been done without these known age birds that Chuck studied. But there's one study that's even longer term than Chuck, if you can believe that, and that's Bob Cunningham's work. So here's Bob as uh, a young man, probably in the early 40s, I guess, with Ernest Joy looking in one of his little weather shacks. And Bob started a study um, on the on long, I guess he didn't know at the time that it would be on long-term changes in fog chemistry and climatology, because Ken Island is such a beautiful place to study fog. And here is Bob uh, years later, and for Bowdoin faculty here, imagine publishing a paper with this title, Fog Studies in the Bay of Fundy Over a 60-Year Span. <laughs> it makes you tired just to think about it, doesn't it? Um, and Bob is uh, still interested in the weather. Um, um, I, I have to say a little bit about uh, Bob Mock, uh, director here. Um, he not only instructs the students on how to throw a football, which he's very good at, but he is the brains behind um, our databases. Uh, he's a very good computer programmer as well as a, as a great field biologist. And I wouldn't be able to do what I do with the savanna sparrows I study without Bob's uh, work. The other thing that Bob has done just this year, which is really cool, you can check this out yourself, he has set up a weather station on Ken Island that communicates via satellite, you can now instantaneously look at what the weather's like at Ken Island from the comfort of your office here at, on campus. So this is, these are data from this last snowstorm over the weekend uh, showing in red solar radiation. So you see three peaks that corresponds to two sunny days and a cloudy day, and then temperature where you had a great big fall. So you can actually uh, use that at any time. The Graham and Ann fishermen are really indebted to Bob for that and using it all the time. Uh, Bob will have his last summer as director, or at least for a while. Maybe he'll go on sabbatical and return someday. Um, and we just hired a, a wonderful biologist, Damon Gannon. He has his PhD from uh, Duke University. He does a lot of work with marine mammals and marine fish. He's doing a postdoc in Florida. But he'll be up here in May and will overlap and apprentice with Bob. So we're looking forward to that. Um, but we don't do just science on Kent Island, um, as Alan made mention of where it's, it's a, maybe science is only half of it. I think the other half is, is, is community. Um, so we have a lot of uh, traditions that have grown over the year. One of them is a July 4th beach cleanup on the left. Um, and there are prizes for the most useful item, the most disgusting item. And I think uh, Kevin and Amy here won the most patriotic item that year, which was some rope that happened to be red, white, and blue. Um, we typically have one or two artists in residence on the island, so in our, when we're not doing science, um, we have the opportunity to, to have uh, art lessons. There's Susan Kalini in there for any artists in the crowd, and Amber Reed with our two um, artists in residence. Uh, we do music, um, make our own music. There is no electricity on the island other than the solar panels. We don't have internet, we don't have email, we don't have television, and so you pretty much are on your own for doing your own um, kind of entertainment, do a, a little bit of athletics and yoga. And uh, at least once a summer, um, we dive into the cold Bay of Fundy. At least I, I don't do it every, any more than once. Uh, it's, it's frighteningly cold. Um, and people get out of there very fast. Alas, we don't have boat and dining service, but we do have great food. We have a student cook who's hired every summer and um, cooks Monday through Wednesday, then, uh, sorry, Monday through Friday, and then on weekends we split the, uh, split the, uh, the duty. Um, I don't think uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service agent Stott is in the audience, so I can point out the gull eggs in the, in the, <laughs> in the bowl there on the right. But you're, you're pledged to secrecy here. Actually, this is going to be a podcast, isn't it? Uh-oh, I'm busted. <laughs> um, I think the statute of limitations has run out on those eggs. Uh, Saturday night is a time for writing letters. Uh, here's Corey Freeman Gallant penning one home, and, and we're always glad when the mailboat arrives once a week and, and sad if we don't have a letter from loved ones. Uh, weekends is a time to do your laundry and maybe play a game of chess. Um, I have to mention the, the caretaking arrangement we have now, uh, the, the uh, the successors to Ernest Joy and Alan Moses are Russell Ingalls on the left, a Graham and Ann fisherman who I really wish had been here tonight. He's become a, a very close friend and um, 
someone very important to the island, not just because of him, but because of his father and his two, his, formerly his two uncles, one of his uncles still alive, his two brothers. The whole Ingalls family have been a real uh, safety network for us and, uh, and kind of a connection to um, Graham and Ann. And then, of course, Mark Murray on the right, who is caretaker at Coastal Studies Center as well and the handiest person you'd, you'd ever want out on the island. I think we call him adjunct professor of insular biotechnology or something like that. Uh, so they marshal us all. Uh, we don't have facilities management either, so we do all the chores. Everybody's assigned different chores, and we've got a big project like uh, rebuilding a wharf or, um, or uh, firming up the foundation of one of the buildings Why everybody gets called into service. Okay, if you'll permit me, I'm, I'm going to just do two more things, I think, here. Um, but I have to tell you one more gun tale. <clears throat> um, in, in 1959, uh, Russell Ingalls' great uncle, Wesley Ingalls, who owned Hay and Sheep Island um, at the time, wanted a way for his nephews to be able to make a little bit of money. So he took two crates of snowshoe hares, five in each crate, and let them loose on Hay Island with the idea that they would then breed and they would be able to capture them and sell them to hunt clubs and um, sell them for biomedical research at three or four dollars a head. Well, being bunnies, they did what bunnies do and first there were 10, then there were 50, then there were 500 and then at low tide they ran across to Kent Island and they, they began to just plow down everything in sight. They're, they're voracious herbivores. So this, you may not recognize it, that's a spruce tree on the right hand side. Um, if you go, or I should, I'm going to use the past tense rather hopefully here. Um, it used to be if you went anywhere on Ken Island and just aimed your camera down on the ground, that's what you'd see, snowshoe hair droppings, just littering the whole place. And the understory of the forest, you could see almost from coast to coast. The snowshoe hares mowed everything down. These are just asters in the understory. Zero seedlings made it from 1959 until the present. What's the problem? Well... Once they run out of food, they start climbing trees. I didn't believe this till I actually saw one spring snowshoe hare fur about eight feet up in a tree and gnawed branches. So they actually claw their way up. Graham and Ann Fisherman had told me that, but I, uh, I had to see evidence of it first. And they actually are killing now trees. And this picture here shows an area that was, was uh, like some of the areas that were forested when I got there in 1986. So it looked like a catastrophe that the um, breeding grounds of leeches storm petrels were being decimated by this introduced herbivore. Just to make sure that the lack of recruitment of trees wasn't simply an effect of the weather, we set up an exclosure and actually a series of these, which are just fenced areas to see what would happen if you excluded snowshoe hares from the area. So that's what it looks like just outside our exclosure. And you see some herbs, but you don't see a single seedling. If you, this is after two years now. You look inside the exclosure, and what you see is hundreds and hundreds of balsam fir, red spruce, mountain ash, and birches. So this was good experimental evidence that um, something had to be done to save the forest. <clears throat> so we started on a, our first regimen in the late 90s of trying to eradicate snowshoe hares. And I, wanna, <laughs> I want to... Uh, So that's one of my that's one of my stretchers, but um, that's that's what it felt like trying to get rid of the snowshoe hares. So I was at a loss. What do I do? And I thought, well, who does eradication best? The New Zealand Department of Conservation and the wildlife biologists. So I wrote them and said, look, we tried everything. We shot them. We trapped them. And this is the email I got back. Uh, <laughs> looks to me like you just lacked a little persistence. Um, but as Alan said, I'm stubborn, so I went to the top. I went to the uh, vertebrate pest control officer of New Zealand, and I asked her her advice, and this is what she wrote. <laughs> Erratic... <laughs> okay, now, remember, I have four older brothers, and we're all armed, so you don't say that sort of stuff. 
So uh, we took the gloves off, and I got on the internet, and I met Craig. <laughs> uh, so Craig is, lives in northern New Brunswick. Uh, I've actually never met him in person, but we've corresponded, and we got him to come down with 16 of his hounds and two of his friends. Russell said they did a lot of drinking, but they also did a lot of, <laughs> a lot of shooting. But, uh, but we, that was just the beginning. Then I went to... Uh, my optometrist and my dentist and my other dentist friend and brought out the really big guns. Uh, so uh, two of these uh, gentlemen are here tonight, uh, Rick Elsesser and Tom Scaling, and this is Russell on the right, Bob Nagley from Barry's Opticians. Um, and they went and, and uh, really got things going, uh, but we still had to make sure the job got done, so we recruited Bowdoin students as well. And um, I think we got the last of them. No one has seen a snowshoe hare on Ken Island since last April. And uh, Russell's been out this winter in the snow, and he says there are no tracks. So um, here's what it looks like. I don't know about you, but I see that and just get a, a surge of pride. Those are, those are uh, white birch seedlings, and I don't think anybody's seen that in a half century. Um, that's what it looked like at first. This is what it looked like more recently. So I think in another, in another 15 or 20 years, Ken Island is going gonna, is gonna to really bounce back. OK, um, I'm almost done now. I have to do more things I'm going to say. Uh, I once made a comment to our dean, um, Crystal, that uh, when biologists start talking about history of biology, it's a warning sign that they <laughs> can no longer do biology. So she's, she's probably um, scrolling through possible names for the next bass. Professor. <laughs> so I need to say something uh, to show that I really do do research. I do research on um, savannah sparrows on Kent Island. And uh, this is a paper that I just got galley proofs uh, from. It's going to appear in the International Journal of Animal Behavior in April. <clears throat> and it's entitled The Influence of Different Tutor Types on Song Learning in a Natural Bird Population. And just to describe the research very quickly, what we found is that contrary to what people had thought in the past, in this population of birds anyway, they don't learn their entire song from just one model. But rather what they, or, and they also don't learn in just one time of their life. Instead, they seem to pick up little elements just the way humans do in development of our own speech. And then they combine them into a unique si song. So every male in that population has a Kent Island dialect, but also has an individually recognizable song put together by these pieces. I don't want to say anything more about the research, but I do want to say a lot. I want to say a little bit more about my co-authors. To do a study like this required um, collaborators with strengths that I don't have in, in uh, molecular biology, in uh, quantitative sound analysis, in recording. So I recruited uh, a number of people. Meredith Sweat in Upper Left is a PhD student at the University of Montana. Uh, Iris Levin is at University of Missouri at St. Louis doing her PhD. Don Krudzma is in the middle, uh, University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and that's his book, Singing Life of Birds, which you should buy. Uh, Corey Freeman Gallant is the uh, chair of the biology department at Skidmore College, and Heather Williams is chair of the biology department at Williams College. Four of the five of them got their start in ornithology as undergraduates at Kent Island. <clears throat> the only one who didn't was uh, Don Krudzma, but even he has a Kent Island connection because he told me that he first started recording birds when Sewell Pettengill, of the class of around 35, I would say, uh, one of Alfred Gross's students, put in his hand a tape recorder and turned him on to the magic of birds. OK, just to wrap up, um, by the late 40s, Ernest's letters take on a di different tone. I'll read this one to you. Dear Bob, just a line to let you know that I am still on top of the earth. God, what a winter. Cold wind. And he, by the way, I haven't mentioned that he's lived there year-round. Uh, Bowden paid him $300 a year, so that's a little less than a dollar a day. Uh, he did get a raise. By the end, um, it was up to three sixty dollars a year. Um, and he maintained weather records and, and the, maintained the buildings and so on. God, what a winter. Cold wind, snow, and rain, and such mighty rough seas as we have had this winter. I just wish you could see the basin. It is piled up with ice like the North Pole. Today is mighty cold, blowing like hell, and vapor flying. But thank God it won't be too long now before spring. And you will be getting ready to come up, I hope. 
Um, in the f- spring of 1948, um, Ernest's uh, housekeeper slash common law wife, Carrie Chase, uh, got ill. <clears throat> Ernest lit a fire on the northwest corner of uh, Kent Island to try to get help and was unable to get help, and um, she died in the fall of 1948. <clears throat> so Ernest spent the winter of 1948 alone on the islands, and that was the last winter for him. He, his last letter to Bob Cunningham ended with a, the most poignant line. He said, <clears throat> he said, I have lived a long but not a very useful life, but it can't be helped now I see where I could have done better with love to all, Ernest. <clears throat> but I think everybody here would agree that um, Ernest did a lot in his life. I think he'd be very proud of the legacy of the Bowdoin Scientific Station. And, uh, and I think we're tremendously fortunate as a small college to have a, a place like Kent Island. Thank you very much. <clears throat>